Hibernation 66 Grizzly's Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation Read by David Grizzly Smith Flatland, a romance of many dimensions, by Edwin Abbott Abbott, read by David Grizzly Smith. Part 1. This World. Section 9 of the Universal Color Bill But meanwhile, the intellectual arts were fast decaying. The art of sight recognition, being no longer needed, was no longer practiced, and the studies of geometry, statics, kinetics, and other kindred subjects came soon to be considered superfluous and fell into disrepute and neglect even at our university. The inferior art of feeling speedily experienced the same fate at our elementary schools. Then the isosceles classes, asserting that specimens were no longer used or needed, and refusing to pay the customary tribute from the criminal classes to the service of education, waxed daily more numerous and more insolent on the strength of their immunity from the old burden which had formerly exercised the twofold wholesome effect of at once taming their brutal nature and thinning their excessive numbers. Year by year the soldiers and artisans began more vehemently to assert, and with increasing truth, that there was no great difference between them and the very highest class of polygons, now that they were raised to an equality with the latter, and enabled to grapple with all the difficulties and solve all the problems of life, whether statical or kinetical, by the simple process of color recognition and not content with the natural neglect into which sight recognition was falling, they began boldly to demand the legal prohibition of all monopolizing and aristocratic arts, and the consequent abolition of all endowments for the studies of sight recognition, mathematics, and feeling. Soon they began to insist that inasmuch as color, which was a second nature, had destroyed the need of aristocratic distinctions, the law should follow the same path, and that henceforth all individuals and all classes should be recognized as absolutely equal and entitled to equal rights. Finding the higher orders wavering and undecided, the leaders of the revolution advanced still further in their requirements, and at last demanded that all classes alike, the priests and the women not excepted, should do homage to color by submitting to be painted. When it was objected that priests and women had no sides, they retorted that nature and expediency concurred in dictating that the front half of every human being, that is to say the half containing his eye and mouth, should be distinguishable from his hinder half. They therefore brought before a general and extraordinary assembly of all the states of Flatland a bill, proposing that in every woman the half containing the eye and mouth should be colored red and the other half green. And the priests were to be painted in the same way, red being applied to that semicircle in which the eye and mouth form the middle point, while the other or hinder semicircle was to be colored green. 
Well, there was no little cunning in this proposal, which indeed emanated not from any isosceles, for no being so degraded would have had angularity enough to appreciate, much less to devise such a model of statecraft, but from an irregular circle, who, instead of being destroyed in his childhood, was reserved by a foolish indulgence to bring desolation upon his country and destruction on myriads of his followers. On the one hand, the proposition was calculated to bring the women in all classes over to the side of chromatic innovation, for by assigning to the women the same two colors as were assigned to the priests, the revolutionists thereby ensured that in certain positions every woman would appear like a priest and be treated with corresponding respect and deference, a prospect that could not fail to attract the female sex in a mass. But by some of my readers the possibility of the identical appearance of priests and women under the new legislation may not be recognized. If so, a word or two will make it obvious. Imagine a woman duly decorated according to the new code, with the front half, the half containing the eye and mouth, red, and with the hinder half green. Look at her from the side. Obviously you will see a straight line. Half red, half green. Now imagine a priest whose mouth and whose front semicircle is consequently colored red, while his hinder semicircle is green, so that the diameter divides the green from the red. If you contemplate the great man so as to have your eye in the same straight line as his dividing diameter, what you will see will be a straight line, of which one half will be red and the other green. The whole line will be rather shorter, perhaps, than that of a full-sized woman, and will shade off more rapidly towards his extremities. But the identity of the colors would give you an immediate impression of the identity, if not class, making you neglectful of other details. Bear in mind, the decay of sight recognition which threatened society at the time of the color revolts add to the certainty that women would speedily learn to shade off their extremities so as to imitate the circles, and it must then be surely obvious to you, my dear reader, that the color bill placed us under a great danger of confounding a priest with a young woman. How attractive this prospect must have been to the frail sex may readily be imagined. They anticipated with delight the confusion that would ensue. At home they might hear political and ecclesiastical secrets intended not for them, but for their husbands and brothers, and might even issue commands in the name of a priestly circle. Out of doors, the striking combination of red and green, without addition of any other colors, would be sure to lead the common people into endless mistakes, and the woman would gain whatever the circles lost in the deference of the passers-by. As for the scandal that would befall the circular class, if the frivolous and unseemly conduct of the women were imputed to them, and as to the consequent subversion of the Constitution— the female sex could not be expected to give a thought to these considerations. Even in the households of the circles, the women were all in favor of the universal color bill. Now, the second object aimed at by the bill was the gradual demoralization of the circles themselves. In the general intellectual decay, they still preserved their pristine clearness and strength of understanding. From their earliest childhood, familiarized in their circular households with the total absence of color, the nobles alone preserved the sacred art of sight recognition, with all the advantages that result from that admirable training of the intellect. Hence, up to the date of the introduction of the universal color bill, the circles had not only held their own, but even increased their lead of other classes by abstinence from the popular fashion. Now, therefore, the artful irregular whom I described above as the real author of this diabolical bill 
determined at one blow to lower the status of the hierarchy by forcing them to submit to the pollution of color, and at the same time to destroy their domestic opportunities of training in the art of sight recognition, so as to enfeeble their intellects by depriving them of their pure and colorless homes. Once subjected to the chromatic taint, every parental and childish circle would demoralize each other. Only in discerning between the father and the mother would the circular infant find problems for the exercise of its understanding, problems too often likely to be corrupted by maternal impostures, with the result of shaking the child's faith in all logical conclusions. Thus, by degrees, the intellectual luster of the priestly order would wane, and the road would then lie open for a total destruction of all aristocratic legislature for the subversion of our privileged classes. Thus, by degrees, the intellectual luster of the priestly order would wane, and the road would then lie open for a total destruction of all aristocratic legislature and for the subversion of our privileged classes. Section 10. Of the Suppression of the Chromatic Sedition The agitation for the Universal Color Bill continued for three years, and up to the last moments of that period it seemed as though anarchy were destined to triumph. A whole army of polygons who turned out to fight as private soldiers was utterly annihilated by a superior force of isosceles triangles, the squares and pentagons, meanwhile, remaining neutral. Worse than all, some of the ablest circles fell a prey to conjugal fury. Infuriated by political animosity, the wives in many a noble household wearied their lords with prayers to give up their opposition to the color bill, and some, finding their entreaties fruitless, fell on and slaughtered their innocent children and husbands, perishing themselves in the act of carnage. It is recorded that during that triennial agitation no less than twenty-three circles perished in domestic discord. Great indeed was the peril. It seemed as though the priests had no choice between submission and extermination, when suddenly the course of events was completely changed by one of those picturesque incidents which statesmen ought never to neglect, often to anticipate, and sometimes perhaps to originate, because of the absurdly disproportionate power with which they appeal to the sympathies of the populace. It happened that an isosceles of a low type, with a brain little, if at all, above four degrees, accidentally dabbling in the colors of some tradesman whose shop he had plundered, painted himself, or caused himself to be painted, for the story varies, with the twelve colors of a dodecahedron. Going into the marketplace, he accosted in a feigned voice a maiden, the orphan daughter of a noble polygon, whose affection in former days he had sought in vain, and by a series of deceptions, aided on the one side by a string of lucky accidents too long to relate, and on the other by an almost inconceivable fatuity and neglect of ordinary precautions on the part of the relations of the bride, he succeeded in consummating the marriage. The unhappy girl committed suicide on discovering the fraud to which she had been subjected. When the news of this catastrophe spread from state to state, the minds of the women were violently agitated. Sympathy with the miserable victim and anticipations of similar deceptions for themselves, their sisters, and their daughters made them now regard the color bill in an entirely new aspect. Not a few openly avowed themselves converted to antagonism, and the rest needed only a slight stimulus to make a similar avowal. 
Seizing this favorable opportunity, the circles hastily convened an extraordinary assembly of the states, and besides the usual guard of convicts, they secured the attendance of a large number of reactionary women. Amidst an unprecedented concourse, the chief circle of those days— by name uh, Pentacyclus, arose to find himself hissed and hooted by a hundred and twenty thousand isosceles. But he secured silence by declaring that henceforth the circles would enter a policy of concession. Yielding to the wishes of the majority, they would accept the color bill. The uproar being at once converted to applause, he invited Chromatistes, the leader of the sedition, into the center of the hall to receive in the name of his followers the submission of the hierarchy. Then followed a speech, a masterpiece of rhetoric, which occupied nearly a day in the delivery to which no summary can do justice. With a grave appearance of impartiality, he declared that as they were now finally committing themselves to reform or innovation, it was desirable that they should take one last view of the perimeter of the whole subject, its defects as well as its advantages. Gradually introducing the mention of the dangers to the tradesmen, the professional classes, and the gentlemen, he silenced the rising murmurs of the isosceles by reminding them that, in spite of all these defects, he was willing to accept the bill, if it was approved by the majority. But it was manifest that all, except the isosceles, were moved by his words, and were either neutral or averse to the bill. Turning now to the workmen, he asserted that their interests must not be neglected, and that if they intended to accept the color bill, they ought to at least do so with a full view of the consequences. Many of them, he said, were on the point of being admitted to the class of regular triangles. Others anticipated for their children a distinction they could not hope for themselves. That honorable ambition would now have to be sacrificed. With the universal adoption of color, all distinctions would cease. Regularity would be confused with irregularity. Development would give place to retrogression. The workman would in a few generations be degraded to the level of the military or even the convict class. Political power would be in the hands of the greatest number, that is to say the criminal classes, who are already more numerous than the workmen, and would soon outnumber all the other classes put together, when the usual compensative laws of nature were violated. A subdued murmur of assent ran through the ranks of the artisans, and Chromatistes, in alarm, attempted to step forward and address them. But he found himself encompassed with guards and forced to remain silent, while the chief circle, in a few impassioned words, made a final appeal to the women, exclaiming that, if the color bill passed, no marriage would henceforth be safe, no woman's honor secure. Fraud, deception, hypocrisy would pervade every household. Domestic bliss would share the fate of the Constitution and pass to speedy perdition. Sooner than this, he cried, Come death. At these words, which were the preconcerted signal for action, the isosceles convicts fell on and transfixed the wretched chromatistes. The regular classes opening their ranks made way for a band of women who, under direction of the circles, moved back foremost, invisibly and unerringly upon the unconscious soldiers. The artisans, imitating the example of their betters, also opened their ranks. Meanwhile, bands of convicts occupied every entrance with an impenetrable phalanx. The battle, or rather carnage, was of short duration. Under the skillful generalship of the circles, almost every woman's charge was fatal, and very many extracted their sting uninjured, ready for a second slaughter. 
but no second blow was needed. The rabble of the isosceles did the rest of the business for themselves. Surprised, leaderless, attacked in front by invisible foes, and finding egress cut off by the convicts behind them, they at once, after their manner, lost all presence of mind and raised the cry of treachery. This sealed their fate. Every isosceles now saw and felt a foe in every other. In half an hour, not one of that vast multitude was living, and the fragments of seven score thousand of the criminal class slain by one another's angles attested the triumph of order. The circles delayed not to push their victory to the uttermost. The working men they spared, but decimated. The militia of the equilaterals was at once called out, and every triangle suspected of irregularity on reasonable grounds was destroyed by court-martial, without the formality of exact measurement by the social board. The homes of the military and artisan classes were inspected in a course of visitations extending through upwards of a year, and during that period every town, village, and hamlet was was systematically purged of that excess of the lower orders which had been brought about by the neglect to pay the tribute of criminals to the schools and university, and by the violation of the other natural laws of the constitution of Flatland. Thus the balance of classes was again restored. Needless to say that henceforth the use of color was abolished and its possession prohibited. Even the utterance of any word denoting color, except by the circles or qualified scientific teachers, was punished by severe penalty. Only at our university, in some of the very highest and most esoteric classes, which I myself have never been privileged to attend, it is understood that the sparing use of color is still sanctioned for the purpose of illustrating some of the deeper problems of mathematics. But of this I can only speak from hearsay. Elsewhere in Flatland, color is now non-existent. The art of making it is known to only one living person, the chief circle for the time being, and by him it is handed down on his deathbed to none but his successor. One manufactory alone produces it, and lest the secret should be betrayed, the workmen are annually consumed, and fresh ones introduced. So great is the terror with which even now our aristocracy looks back to the far distant days of the agitation for the Universal Color Bill. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzliesgrowls.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.